Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar, brought to you by TechStrong and Mirantis. My name is Cody J. Brown. I'm the host of TechStrong Learning. We have an exciting panel ahead, but first, I have just a couple of housekeeping notes. First, today's session is being recorded, so if you miss any of our discussion or you'd like to rewatch or share with a friend, the on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude our live webinar today. If you have any questions, we want you to direct those to the Q&A tab on the right side of the screen. And that's also where you're going to find the chat tab, where we want you to engage with, with us, engage with your fellow audience members. Just let us know if you have any thoughts. Um, I'll also point your direction to the handouts tab. This is where you'll find um, a copy of the Pulse Meter Report, which is the main topic of today's conversation. Um, so feel free to download that to follow along. And at the conclusion of our webinar, we will be giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards. So be sure to stick around. Our topic today is there's no easy button for managing Kubernetes and the cloud. And I'm joined today by Sean O'Meara, Field CTO and VP of Product Marketing at Mirantis, and Dan Kirsch, Principal Analyst and Managing Director here at TechStrong Research. It is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Dan to get us started, but Dan, Sean, thank you both so much for joining me today. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks, Cody. So, so as Cody mentioned, today we're going to be talking about a pulse meter report. Uh, pulse meter is a series of flash polls that we at uh, TechStrong Research host, and uh, we share it amongst our members. Our members are interested in cloud, cloud native security, uh, management of systems, and generally digital transformation. So across all of our polls, we had a, a little under 1,100 uh, participants. And as Cody mentioned, the report is available in the handouts tab of the platform. And there's five data points and, and a little bit more information on the report. And today, Sean and I will be talking about a few of the insights uh, that, that are in the report. So let me uh, hand it over to Sean to introduce himself. Oh, thank you. Good morning. Um, yeah, interesting to be here. I was looking through the results of this report, and I'm really interested to discuss them a little bit further. Um, I have been in this industry for a long time. Every time I get introduced at conferences, they use an old blurb of mine that says I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, it feels like a lot longer. It has actually been a lot longer. It makes me feel old. Um, but I've been working with customers in the industry, building everything from infrastructure to designing application platforms for over 25 years now. Um, and over that time, I feel I've learned a lot, seen a lot of the business, seen how circular IT is. You know, we keep coming back to a lot of the trends with different names. Um, and a lot of the challenges we're working with today are just new from a technology point of view. But it's always fascinating to me to see how people are using technology. Um, and the one big trend which I see, which I'd like to see more of um, and understand better, is how are we changing our approach to the market from the point of view of how do we focus on what's important to us? So a little bit of how what interests me and how I look at this world. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of those problems are the same problems we've had for the last 20 years, mm -hmm. but they just require different approaches. You know, we're, we've been, we were concerned about security 15 years ago. We're still as concerned about security, but we can't put firewalls around all of our data and uh, protect it in, in old ways, which is... Oh, we, I think we've also matured in a way. We've come to accept things. You know, 20 years ago, we would never have allowed somebody to bring their own personal laptop or a phone into the office. Now, pretty much everybody's using it in a personal laptop way. So it is interesting to see how things have changed. Yeah. Um, I also think the way, we, the way we approach IT in general has changed enormously. Even though we have many of the same problems, we're, we're more inclined to be focused on what's important to us. Um, and of course, the advent of open source has definitely changed a lot of that and a lot of that thinking. Yeah, the entire understanding of open source has, has switched over the last few years. And so the acceptance of open source, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what I mean by the understanding is, you know, it's no longer, oh, this is just experimental. It's no, we're building our entire company on open source. Yep. I think I saw a statistic and it was just interesting from the British uh, Open Source Council that 78% of companies are using open source within their businesses. And something like 45% of them don't even know it. 
<laughs> some crazy figure like that. So, uh, and, and those who say they're not using it probably, probably are using it, which, which dovetails well, dovetails well into our first data point mm. is, uh, about cloud. Because you know most businesses are, you know, I'm not going to do research on, on is cloud a popular trend. We all know it is, but an area that's always interesting in terms of debate is uh, hybrid cloud and multi cloud. Do you go? Do you go alone, or do you, do you have a hybrid or multi-cloud approach? Um, so we we asked the audience, are you considering a hybrid or multi-cloud approach? Almost seventy-five percent said a hybrid uh, and/or multi-cloud approach. And you know, my my feeling is hybrid and multi-cloud are here to stay. Even if you say we're gonna we're gonna go with a single cloud through acquisitions or various teams using different clouds, or or you're partnering with a company that's using a different cloud. Inevitably, you're going to have to support some sort of multi or hybrid cloud approach. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, what's interesting to me about this is everybody jumped on the, the cloud bandwagon. Um, and looking at some of the other statistics I've seen in the market about the growth of cloud, and especially the hyperscalers versus on premise, they're actually, you know, they're both growing. Yes, cloud's growing at an enormous rate faster. But what's interesting for me and the customers that I deal with on a regular basis is many of them took a cloud first approach and inevitably went to one large provider and they picked one of the big hyperscalers and they went all in. And that was great, but then they left behind this enormous amount of workload that was left on on-prem in many cases. Um, they had fantastic you know, legacy systems that were serving the business up till now. They've gone all in on cloud, they've put an enormous amount of workload. And then the question is, hang on, we've got to link these two things together. And that's been the rise of hybrid. So that's been one of the trends which I've definitely seen and it backs this, this statistic up enormously. Um, but the other one for me has been interesting is that guys have gone into the single cloud provider and then that cloud provider has failed them in some way. And that to me is one of the big drivers of driving hybrid. Um, and the mentality around hybrid and multi-cloud, it's how do I deal with, uh, never mind just failure, but cost management and leverage over providers. Um, it's great to be in one provider, but hey, they can just put their prices up. And if you can't get out, you're stuck. It's always an interesting debate to have. Yeah, and it, it comes from so many different angles because you know, <laughs> I've worked with a lot of companies who are on their sort of cloud 2.0 or 3.0 effort where they moved everything to the cloud and they said, oh geez, this is way more expensive than we thought. We're not really gaining any of the benefits of the cloud because we just took all of our stuff that's on premises, moved it to the cloud, but the cloud is compute, it's infrastructure, whatever problems you were having on premises, you're probably gonna have um, in, the, in the cloud. And so it's building that business case can be really difficult. Yeah, and I think it's it's really important that we have to understand that moving to the cloud from your legacy on-premise system without changing your way of work doesn't gain you all that much. You just, you know, somebody else is looking after your infra. You, you're not utilizing that infra in any better way. Um, we were talking about cloud native application designs um, earlier in the week. Uh, and it is interesting for me that many people think cloud native is just putting the workload on cloud. And that's not what it is. It, it's changing the approach to thinking about how you design workload. And that is going to be a critical part of, of driving real hybrid or, and multi-cloud deployments as we look into the future here. <clears throat> yeah, and when, what about the idea of you also have to change, um, you, know, you have to change your processes, you have to change your culture. Um, and, and so there's obviously a technology um, different technology approach to cloud native, but it also, you know, your developers need to think differently, use different tools. Um, which I think one of the things which I'd like to catch you there on, Dan, is, is that, that question of culture. The change to using cloud native design tech, design is incredibly reliant on you changing the old traditional culture. <clears throat> you know, traditionally we have this siloed culture of managing infrastructure, of delivering applications, um, we tend to have somebody write an app, somebody worry about deploying it, somebody worry about operating it. You know, the whole DevOps promise is that we're going to do all of that in a more cohesive way with teams taking more responsibility. That means a culture change. You know, building an agile application 
is it's as much important to have an agile culture behind it. You have a culture that is an agile that is you know, stuck in the bureaucracy of the 80s. Um, you're not really going to move forward here. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to, uh, you know, you, you can make it, you can sort of publish as many infinity charts as you want. But if, you're, if your culture is set up in a waterfall way, um, or if you, if you sort of adopt the uh, infinity loop that we're all familiar with, my feeling is the infinity loop is really just a waterfall methodology with a loop at the end to connect it all. But it's really about being developer centric, being customer outcome centric. And it's, it's a whole different approach and just, you yeah. know, we're going to take it from this step to this step to this step. It doesn't work. Actually, um, that, would be an, that would be a lovely poll to see it. how many people have implemented agile without actually implementing agile <laughs> you know, glorified waterfall yeah it's, yeah you, you, just reading the phoenix project doesn't make you uh an operational devops uh, no no certainly not it's funny so what, you the phoenix project we were talking about it yesterday i mean it's a great book don't get oh, yeah. me wrong but, uh, anybody who hasn't read it should go out and read it it's a great it's a good story if nothing else Oh, yeah. And it's great for those not in technology. I mean, about mm -hmm. thinking about culture and process and, and for sure. new ways of approaching problems. So we're talking about the idea of um, keep it, keeping um, some of your work on, on premises. So um, yeah. we, we asked uh, folks, what's the leading driver for maintaining on-premises infrastructure? So not surprisingly, uh, about over half said security. But then also co cost, latency, geolocality, depending on, which is important depending on uh, where your company is located. Latency is still an issue. Um, any of those pop out at you or surprise you or anything like that? Not really. I think, you know, keeping, a, keeping us on prem is, I come back to that discussion about legacy. You know, firstly, what's moving into the cloud today that's, that's truly cloud ready or cloud native? It's only really a small portion of a lot of the traditional workload that's coming out of large enterprises. Now, we're talking large enterprises primarily. I think a lot of small startup or cloud-first companies, it's a different debate. But we talk about traditional large enterprises. Security is always a major concern, but I think we need to unpack security just down another layer. Security is not just about access control. I think security, you could lump the question of IP into that. You've got companies that, you know, the, the age old story, you'll have retailers who consider certain parts of their IP who are never going to put that on top of Amazon because they see them as competition. You see big manufacturing companies that are doing deep research into, you know, let's say, new vehicles, new vehicle designs. They don't want that data to ever be outside of their corporate you know, firewall outside of their corporate networks where anybody could have access to it. Um, that's driving a lot of the security. I don't think it's the traditional question of, do you have encryption? Um, uh, my, my feeling anyway. Um, but the other one that jumps out to me, or well, the other two, I, th I suppose in many ways, geolocality and security are, are linked because of things like the GDPR rules. The other one that jumps out to me, and we're seeing some of this trending now again is cost. You're seeing customers hitting a certain scale, um, customers with large um, HPC type clusters, you know, 10,000 node HPC clusters, who tried to move them to the cloud and realized with the sheer volume of data that they were moving around, plus the, just the sheer volume of compute that they needed, um, that the cost is driving them back on prem. But taking advantage of some of the newer technologies around to reduce the effort of managing that. And I think that's been the big, the big difference in the last five, probably the five years or so, where previously running on-prem was a very complex and painful exercise. You're getting more companies now who are making that experience of running on-prem a lot more cloud-like. And the acceptance of technologies like OpenStack and other technologies to make it easier to, to run your on-prem infrastructure. Um, and the maturity of those technologies, I should say, rather than the acceptance, um, is driving down that cost in many ways. 
yeah, it, you don't even really. You know, a few years ago, I, I wrote a book, uh, "Hybrid Cloud for Dummies," and, and then and then "Cloud for Dummies." And you know, there was a lot of talk about, um, uh, you know, are you going to have you know, on-premises cloud? Are you going to use a third-party cloud? Are you going to you know stand up your own? Mm -hmm. You don't even really hear that discussion anymore because folks are taking a cloud-native approach, whether whether it's on-premises or you know, obviously. You know, if you've got a legacy application, you're not going to. But for for net new applications, you might do cloud native on premises, and it's no longer a you know a strange a strange thing to use you know Kubernetes for instance uh, for on premises. No, no, and I mean uh, we see a lot of customers who are doing that. I mean, you know, I mentioned earlier the hybrid story and the legacy workloads. It's wonderful that we can we want to build cloud native applications, which is important. But we've got to put them somewhere, and we have latency that dives connectivity to the old to the old legacy systems. So we probably have data sitting in a you know a big name database somewhere that we're paying millions of dollars for that's been there for ten years. That's part of our corporate solution. If I suddenly stick the workload that has to address that in a public cloud solution half a country away, um, now I've got a problem accessing that data because I've got latency challenges. So I want cloud native. I want to take advantage of the design patterns, but I need to keep it closer to where my data is living today. And that's one of the big drivers I think we're seeing towards building on-prem cloud, or, or at least a cloud experience on-prem. Yeah, and it's it, it, safe to say private cloud. Yeah, pri yeah, pri private cloud is sort of going away in terms of a, a, a terminology. Yes. yes. Around, but, you know, and latency is interesting because I've seen that really cropping up as a growing concern. A few, like five years ago, it wasn't huge unless you were sort of a content delivery type of company. Uh, what I'm seeing is so many companies are, are trying to infuse analytics into, into applications and into the point of transaction that it's impossible to do that if you have latency. You're not going to have a customer willing to sit there for three seconds or even one second as, as uh, you send their data to your on-prem uh, mainframe, and then a, and then a cloud uh, a cloud analytics platform, and then you deliver the results back to their mobile phone. No one customers are just going to leave. Exactly. I mean, that that that's interesting about that though is that's also driving the whole edge, um, the edge compute market. Um, if you think about you know customer customer experience from a perspective of latency. One of the on-prem solutions that we talk about um, is obviously Edge. Whilst it may not be on-prem in someone's big fat data center somewhere, it is in the local pop or you know, connected closely to the local, you know, as near as possible to the local um, cell phone tower. Um, that's also driving that streaming experience um, of how quickly data is processed, gaming, um, AR, and various other things that are that are changing the way we look at compute for the future. Yeah, I mean, all of the you know all of the hype around five G is just yeah you know, the the new business models that are capable with, with faster, more reliable uh, data. So it's not G you can uh, stream uh, your, your favorite Netflix movie faster. It's mm -hmm. you know you can create a whole new business by assuming that customers are sort of always on and and always have data available. Well, I, you know, at the at the risk of stirring something up here, hype is the right word because five 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 G, as far as I'm seeing right now, hasn't given us much more than better better speeds. Um, you know, all the the promises of guaranteed throughput that five G is really all about. I mean, that's a lot of what the really amazing stuff about what five G is going to achieve. I haven't seen a killer workload that is that requires five G yet. It's going to come, um, but I don't think it. I don't think it has had that impact quite yet. Yeah, because five G is not ubiquitous yet either, so that's also a challenge. No, for those of us who live in a city, we we've got it. But you go, uh, you go five miles outside, and, and you don't you no longer have five G, or you walk in a few big buildings, and it's out. Um, we could steer this conversation in a very different direction by talking about folks who are. Uh, Big fans of the metaverse, Web three, and how how five G is going to 
revolutionize yeah. the world. They're just down the road from me here, so we can we can talk about that. I, I'm sitting in Silicon Valley, and I mean, I have a 5G signal on my phone right now. L let me tell you, sometimes I want to force it back to to LTE because I get a better performance on the LTE network. Um, yeah, but we won't talk about the quality of internet access in Silicon Valley in general. <laughs> So let's go to the next data point, which, because I think, you know, we've been talking a lot that, you know, the, for mature organizations that have on, on premises workloads, they're not going to shift everything to the cloud. I mean, it's nearly impossible and you just don't have a business case for it. You don't have a technical case for it. But the, that being said, toothpaste is out of the tube. The cloud, cloud revolution has happened and is happening. And, but it's not, it's not easy. So, so one thing that we asked, um, the uh, participants is what's your biggest challenge when moving workloads into the public cloud? And um, my first takeaway from this is there's a lot of different problems. There's not, there's not one problem. It's a complicated um, uh, journey to the cloud. So we've, uh, we've talked a little bit about application. Um, we've actually talked about quite a few of these already, uh, modernizing yeah. your applications. Um, you know, you, you need different skills and, and of course, with a great resignation, it's really not going out and hiring new folks, but it's investing in your developers, um, creating a better development culture. You don't want, you know, if developers feel like they're just sort of machines or widgets and you talk about, I'm going to increase your productivity, that's going to create a terrible development developer culture. Instead, you want to invest in them, have them, you know, learn new skills. Recognize the fact that you know they might take those skills and go work work somewhere else at some point, and that's okay. Um, and then Kubernetes complexity is is a is a huge uh, concern of um, you know, the research we do. A lot a lot of uh, I do a bunch of webinars, and people are always struggling with the complexity of Kubernetes. So it's complete. Kubernetes has changed. Kubernetes and containers have completely changed the approach to. Uh, to application development, in my opinion, but it's still really challenging. Yeah, um, it, it's difficult technology. <laughs> what's... <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, so, what's interesting to me about these numbers is that I mean, application transformation is edging in front of skilled resources here, but they're you know, basically equal. I think skilled resources and, and Kate's complexity obviously goes together. Um, and we'll talk about application transformation in a second. But the skilled resources, you know, you talk about the great exit. You talk about the fact that we have these skilled resources. We do actually have a lot of really smart, skilled people in the industry. But the billion dollar question for me when we talk about complexity is where are they spending their time? So if I'm taking my limited number of really smart engineering resources that I have in my business. And let's not even talk about application development. Let's just talk about infrastructure management and application deployment. I've got these smart people who understand Kubernetes, <clears throat> but where are they spending their time? What are they focusing on every day? Are they focusing on keeping the lights on? Or are they actually focusing on adding value to the business? And, and what I'm finding when I look around the companies we talk to on a regular basis, a lot of those skilled resources are quite literally spending their time building deployment tools to manage infrastructure underneath the Kubernetes platform. You know, that's a solved problem. Why are we having these smart people solve the same problem over and over again? And what I find though is a lot of these skilled people know that and they're starting to get frustrated and, and they're, they're, they're not enjoying work and that's driving them to, to look and then you have a retention problem within your business. So that, that for me is really, you know, really an interesting challenge. Um, Kubernetes complexity for me, I, I see Kubernetes in two, like from two lenses, I should say. Um, if you think about Kubernetes as an API horizon, we've got above the horizon and below the horizon. Below the horizon of the API of Kubernetes is the infrastructure. So we've got the Kubernetes API and everything below that. So the OS, the patch management, the Kubernetes management, um, the resource management, everything that goes with just keeping Kubernetes ready to take an application. And then we've got above that API horizon where we've got 
containers, container management, the, you know, the configuration of the rules around how you run an application on Kubernetes, CI, CD, all of those things that are agnostic to the infrastructure that it runs on, as agnostic as we can get. You know, the promise of portable containers, whilst it's kind of there, but not quite there. Well, and every cloud vendor tries to make their platform as sticky as possible. Exactly. And that's not really what we want out of Kubernetes or out of containers. As in, you know, Kubernetes is just an orchestrator. Yes, it's the biggest orchestrator out there right now, but it is just an orchestrator. And I think we, we, need, to, we need to get our smart people focusing on at above the line so that they can, they can help businesses grow by helping them application developers focus on building better quality and getting more services out to the businesses rather than worrying about plumbing, essentially. Um, and, and that brings us to the million dollar question around application transformation. The last two things we've spoken about legacy. I mean, well, I as, we, as we talk about Kubernetes, let me just, before, before you- Okay, sorry. That, let me grab in some uh, of the audience feedback. So someone earlier did agree that, uh, Basically said everywhere they've ever been is a glorified waterfall. It doesn't matter yeah. what, what you call it. But then we've got an interesting comment from someone in the chat who said, uh, you know, it's all about when we're talking about Kubernetes and containers, it's all about concepts. So, so, so they said uh, uh, they think it, it's like breathing mercury. However, it's just a remote location of deployment with some new advantages terms of uh, Kubernetes and uh, containers. Any, any thoughts on that? That's an awesome yeah. statement. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay. Um, and I come back to the thing on culture. If, if we have a culture that demands we want to deploy in a different way, then we get away from exactly the problem that I think the participants are talking about. But if we just do more of the same, but just try and move where we run it, then we're always going to be stuck in this quagmire, uh, breathing mercury, which is very, which is very, very 1600s um, science. But um, you know, it's ultimately, unless we change the way we approach dealing with a problem, um, and we change the way we what we prioritize as being important to us as a business. And I think that that's the key word. I was looking for prioritize where our focuses are. We're constantly just going to be, as I said earlier, stuck in this same circular loop of IT where every five to 10 years we go back. You know, we, we started on the mainframe, then we went to um, you know, multiple x86 boxes, then we went to the VMware and virtualization, and then we went back to centralized systems like the mainframe. Yeah, yes, the technologies have changed, but conceptually, it's still the same thing. We're running parallelized workloads on big fat boxes, um, or you know, lots of big fat boxes connected together. Um, we've got to change our mindset. We've got to change the way we think about what a workload and what's infrastructure. And and for me, the biggest value that we get from this move to to real cloud. And what the cloud providers and the on-prem providers can do is ensure that from an application point of view, from a workload point of view, the experience is the same no matter where you run it. And you know, this could cause some controversy, but ultimately it's the democratization or the commoditization of infrastructure. Infrastructure is important. It, it, we have to understand it's still important because we have to run our workload somewhere. But we shouldn't, as application developers, have to make a decision about where we run a workload because we'll have to change our application to utilize it. We should just be able to go, this part of my app needs to run in a data center in Germany. This part can run in California. And this part needs to run on an edge compute cluster um, in 27,000 locations. It shouldn't be that difficult. I mean, it is that today, but maybe I'm dreaming here. <laughs> I tend to do that. Uh, I mean, there, there's, you know, and there's even difficulties in terms of the way different clouds are um, sort of their cost structure. Sometimes you have to architect an application because of, of the cost structure. So, so work, a workload on cloud A could be really efficient. You go to cloud B and your bills are going to be huge because the way that they charge for data egress or, or other things is 
it's different. Absolutely. And it comes back to commoditization. That you know, if I can pick the provider that best suits my needs from a cost and capabilities perspective, because it meets certain needs rather than because I'm stuck to using it because they, they offer an API that only offers, you know, that's different to the API offered from a different provider. And, you know, again, maybe I'm being a little too, too wishful here. No, we've been talking about application portability for a decade. I mean, that's the whole, the whole hope of multi-cloud and hybrid cloud has been application portability. There was some open, open source projects earlier on that have faded off. And uh, that was the hope of containers that, for portability. And we're, we're slowly inching towards there, that point. And then you have a number of businesses who say, I don't really care about portability, so, yeah. which is Pretty fine. Good. What do you think that, Sean, are the biggest... Oh, go ahead. Sorry, just before we jump off this particular topic, one, one of the things I want to talk about is the application transformation challenge, um, which I think is which is a big one. It's, it's something that doesn't get enough attention or, or people don't really understand it enough. And it comes back to this, this challenge of we can't just take our existing applications and move them into cloud. That's not cloud. But the challenge of changing our existing applications to be cloud native is one that should not be underestimated. Um, and it takes a lot of, uh, the word I'm looking for is, is in real intent to do it right, which means you need the right buy-in at all levels of your organization. And if you don't have those goals and that strategy and that buy-in, um, forget about doing application transformation effectively. And I think besides the technology sides of it, which are very real, I want to say don't ignore the cultural buy-in from the non-technology owners or, or um, when you're thinking about application transformation. Uh, something that's close to our heart and something that I think about a lot. So, Yeah, and it's interesting. It's a neat trick that, that a few vendors are doing that you're able to take a, a, a traditional application, put it in a container, and put it in the cloud. Yeah. It doesn't do anything. It, it's, it's sort of taking a... A virtualization approach where you're going to virtualize part of a x86 system and, and run an application on it, which that works. But you know, moving to the cloud, you really got to break that huge application up into services. And otherwise, there, there are applications that you can do that too, for sure. And you should maybe just do those to get moving. But be aware that you're not going to have the same kind of stability that you would have had when they were on a system where the underlying system took care of a lot of the expectations of stability and reliability for you. Just be aware. Yeah, for sure. So let's um, you know, dig in a little bit to the um, Kubernetes and, and infrastructure uh, complexity. Mm. So, so we asked uh, participants, uh, what percentage of your DevOps team's time is spent managing Kubernetes infrastructure? So this is sort of an interesting question and um, you know, a, a sizable amount, almost 40% said it's 10% or less, but then we had 60% say 30% or more of their time is spent managing um, Kubernetes infrastructure. So I think that goes back to your point where you some, some of your best and brightest developers are probably dealing with the plumbing because it's so damn difficult. How do you abstract some of the complexity of, of Kubernetes and, and change this? Because you don't want your developers sitting around managing Kubernetes infrastructure. You want them making your customers really happy and your sales team is going to go nuts if they, if they realize, oh, gee, our developers aren't focused on the, the customer. We might have the best Kubernetes infrastructure in the world, but that's not going to do anything for the bottom line. Yeah, uh, the, the question I would ask myself, you know, if I, was, if I was running this team, if I was responsible for this delivery, I'd be saying how often has, have we put off adding a feature needed by our customers to our application because the team is dealing with patching of the underlying infrastructure? Just ask yourself that question and keep asking yourself that question. H how do we approach this challenge? Um, Firstly, those statistics are really interesting to me because one of the things I'd like to say is 
when we talk about DevOps people, I think we have two schools of DevOps people. We have DevOps people who are infrastructure. We have or three schools. We have DevOps people who are just focused on infrastructure. We have DevOps people who cross that API horizon boundary. And we have DevOps people who only work with you know, CICD and application layers. And it's one of those weird things about our industry is that the same term gets bandied around and used very widely. But to answer your question very specifically, what can we do to allow our teams to focus? Um, I spoke to a customer not so long ago who said to me, we use the CNCF version of Kubernetes. Um, and I didn't want to put him on the spot, but I was a bit like, um, what is the CNCF version of Kubernetes? Um, they don't package it themselves. You're using some vendor's packaging of Kubernetes. Billion dollar question is why are you, when there are so many great choices out there, and yes, I work for a vendor, so you know, take this with a take this with a pinch of salt, but the reality as I see it, to be very blunt, is why are you worrying and dealing with deploying and managing Kubernetes and all that underlying infrastructure? What specific problem are you solving as a business by deploying your own Kubernetes? Um, because if you think about what it takes. It's not just about Kubernetes. It's about all Kubernetes dependencies, you know, etcd. Um, you know, if you're going to use it like a mesh on top of that, so you've then got to manage Istio, go back down the stack, you've got to manage the operating system, you've got to patch the operating system, you've got to set up all that QA and testing. Every time there's a CVE that comes out, you've got to think about how am I going to patch that in a reasonable amount of time? What about the ingress controller? Who's looking after the ingress controller? Um, who's looking after the integration to your corporate identity management solution. Um, you know, those things are pretty standardized. IDMs, I mean, there aren't that many people doing identity management. Um, even in the open source world, there are very few identity management choices. Uh, why are you worrying about all that stuff when somebody else is doing it? And by the way, they're already probably doing it for several hundred or thousand customers. Um, so they're seeing the potential challenges across a thousand people and integrating that and inc incorporating that and can probably move a lot faster than you to look after that infrastructure because they're incentivized to and they specialize in it. So, you know, to stop my diatribe here, is that valuable to your business? And if not, how do you go about leveraging that? Um, you could go and use a public cloud service. Uh, there's some the, every one of the big hyperscalers is doing something and doing some great stuff. Um, I'm not here to knock the hyperscalers in any way. But when you have the need to also have that consistent platform for hybrid cloud, where you want something that's going to work across any one of the hyperscalers, plus on-prem, plus at the edge, um, look at your vendors. Look at what they can offer you and give you to, um, to just take away that problem for you. And it's not about moving people out of looking after infrastructure or, or taking away jobs, which is one of the arguments I hear. It's about allowing these smart people that we employ to then go and focus on building value for the business. And ultimately, we have to get this through our heads. IT can be a major driver for value and ultimately revenue for the businesses that they're within. We're not a business in our own right in most companies. Yeah. I mean, that being said, anyone who sort of says, I, well, there's IT in the business, I think is outdated. I mean, IT needs to be linked to the business. It doesn't really matter what company you are. Um, right. And then I've also seen in terms of build your own or go with a, uh, you know, sort of an opinionated approach. I've seen a, to oversimplify, and this isn't uh, 90s rap, but there's like an East Coast and West Coast difference where, you know, some of those West Coast companies are, you know, we've got the best developers, we're going to build our own. East Coast, the banks and, and mature companies are saying, I'm not going to spend money and time creating my own Linux kernel and my own Kubernetes. Someone's figured that out. I'm going to have my developers work on customer outcomes, not on the plumbing. Yeah, I definitely do. Um, you know, being, I, I come, I grew up a lot in the financial industry, servicing the financial industry, so I probably have more of an East Coast mindset. 
even though I do a lot of my work on the West Coast now. Um, although I'm, I'm pretty global, so I see it across. But I definitely see that. And I think it boils down to a lot of smart techies. Um, and I'm not knocking them, but it's the, it's the not invented here syndrome. It's we can do it better because we're so smart. And you are. You might be able to. But is it worth the 100-hour weeks to do it better yourself? Um, where yeah. you could be doing it d differently rather than better. No, and then you go to your CFO and you say, look what we've done. And he says, well, no one cares. The customer doesn't yeah. care. This doesn't What's the impact on the customer? There isn't really. Yeah, we, we, did, we, we made 2% you know, in profit last quarter um, over the quarter before. Uh, what have you done to achieve that? You're just spending more money. <laughs> Yeah, I like this comment from the audience. Someone says, East Coast, you use other people's work. And <laughs> yes. Sense. Funny, um, that's where all the major banks are, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so so sort of wrap, starting to wrap things up, thinking about the uh, webinar title, there's no easy button for managing Kubernetes. So so what if, if there is a magical button or, or sort of a easier way of, of managing Kubernetes, any... Uh, any thoughts on that, Sean? I do. Um, again, you know, with the caveat that I do work for a vendor that, that this is what we do. Um, there are easier ways to manage Kubernetes. I think we'll come back to that point about cultural change. Um, be focused on what's valuable to your business. Pick vendors, pick partners that will deliver the stuff that is not adding direct value to your business. I think that's the first step. Get out there, um, look at vendors, look at vendors like us. You know, we, we will manage it end to end for you. Um, let you focus on building applications and building value for your business. Um, think and focus on what your priorities are as a business. And bluntly, stop reinventing the wheel. You know, us and other vendors out there are building fantastic products. Um, we do this. We do only this in many cases. Um, so we do specialize and take advantage of those specialties. Um, and frankly, put the pressure on those vendors to, to deliver what you need and use your buying power to walk away from the ones that aren't delivering what you need. Um, and as, a, as a customer, you have that power. Take advantage of it. Pick the guys who are delivering what you need. Um, it's putting it in the shortest way possible. So, so Sean, you've done a great, good point, and you've done a great job of, uh, you know, you, you work for a vendor, but you haven't given your uh, pitch, and we're not going to show slides or anything like that. But um, you, you want to tell a little bit about uh, the Mirantis approach and how, how you guys are working with clients? Sure. Um, that would be great. I mean, just I think Mirantis's mission in life is – what's important to us. And I've mentioned a lot of things here, but our focus is on empowering developers and innovators um, to build extraordinary products. Um, it's really core. And the way we do that is by looking at how do we automate the discovery and integration and operation of infrastructure? I mean, that's our first step. We're moving more and more into also looking at how do we do that for the application layer? Um, and we're focused on open source technologies. So everything we do is built around open source, leveraging open source. And that's really important to our mentality. Um, and then driving those capabilities for the unique needs of our customers. So you know, we don't just come in and say, here's an application package, let's drop it. And yes, we've got great product. I mean, we've got our cloud con container cloud products for doing multi-cloud, hybrid cloud. We've got our Kubernetes MKE that, that is, comes from the Docker enterprise heritage massive customer base and experience of doing that. Um, we've got our OpenStack products, so we build those private clouds, and we've been doing that at massive scale for some really interesting big companies across the world. Um, so for us, but we're really, really focused on is enabling, and I'll come back to that, empowering our customers to build value So by taking care of everything for them. So all they have to think about is the delivery of the applications, the workloads. Um, but at the same time, whilst we do this through product, we have the ability to be flexible and build solutions and, and modify for our customers' unique needs. So we're not stuck in a very specific and rigid pattern. 
um, which I think is our biggest advantage over many of the other things we do. Plus, of course, we're doing this for many, many customers across the globe, many, many Fortune 500 customers at massive, massive scale. So um, that's yeah, they, what Marantis is in a nutshell. You know, and as I say, software never dies and these open source projects never die. So although you know, we're talking about Kubernetes, you know, OpenStack is still huge in many organizations. And uh, growing. And, and Marantis obviously knows Docker is uh, um, still very relevant. Yep. Um, the Docker enterprise business, as we've seen it, um, you know, just a little bit of history. We, we we incorporated the Docker enterprise business at the end of 2019, but we've seen that business grow massively over the last, almost double over the last um, two and a bit years, COVID besides. Um, we've definitely taken the products from them and moved them on considerably. Um, we've still got a lot of great people. Um, the vast majority of the people who came across as part of a um, merger was are still with us um, and have grown into leadership positions and senior positions within the company. Um, our Marantis OpenStack products have seen the same level of growth. We've actually grown OpenStack despite, despite all the noise of the industry saying OpenStack is dead. What we're actually seeing is a massive uptick in companies who are now looking at OpenStack. It's, OpenStack has become boring, so of course now the big corporates are looking at it. Um, you know, and, and to a certain extent, that was our goal. We, we, we've made OpenStack so easy to deploy and manage that it is kind of boring. You, know? you don't want an exciting, you don't want to run your company on an exciting infrastructure. Leading edge infrastructure, exactly. Um, and then, you know, we, we've spent, one of the big things we've learned over the years of doing infrastructure at scale um, is workload and workload transformation is a huge part of that. And so we spend a significant portion of our time and efforts with our customers and, our, and we've got teams that do just this, is look at how do we help our customers make those cultural changes and how do we do the transformation? So, you know, that, that we're trying, we're very focused on supporting our customers through the entire journey and ongoing support beyond that journey. Um, and that, that I think is, um, I'll blow out my own trumpet here, I think that's a unique portion of what Marantis does, is that we're more than just a software, you know, drop and support company. We offer the full gamut of managed services right the way through to helping you do that transformation. Perfect. But at the core, you guys are a software company. You're not, you're not sort of coming in and helping the, you know, the companies that want to do it on their own. They're not, they're not taking the, the approach that you're, you're not sending an army of consultants. No. Um, you know, Marantis is an a enterprise software company um, you, based on open source. We're an enterprise software company adding value to open source. Um, we're, we're able to pick the best open source technologies, add value to them, take away the pain of managing that infrastructure. So we, we're offering enterprise grade software, packaged software. We also offer the support that goes with running that in the real world. Um, and that's an important part of what we do. Yeah, I think that's an important differentiation. Um, so you have any final thoughts before I uh, hand it back to Cody? Um, no, this was great. Thank you very much for the for the time. It was a good conversation. Um, always love to see the this, 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 excuse me the statistics on the market uh, falling over my own tongue this morning. Um, it was great having a chat. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Let me uh, have have uh, Cody wrap things up. Awesome. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Sean. Um, I'd like to quickly remind our audience that this session was recorded. So following this panel, you'll receive an email with a link to access the recording on demand. You can also find it living on the DevOps website at devops.com slash webinars, and be sure to look in the on demand section. So on to giving away our four $25 Amazon gift cards. Our first winner is Keith F. Our second winner is Pearl D. Our third winner is Donovan C. Our fourth and final winner is Georgia V. So congratulations. Um, please keep an eye on your inbox to claim that gift card. And if you don't receive an email, just be sure to check your spam folder. So I would like to thank TechStrong Research for performing the surveys and putting together this Pulse Meter report. I would like to thank Marantis for sponsoring this webinar. And my final thanks, as always, goes to you, our audience. 
We really appreciate you spending time with us. We just ask for one extra moment of your time to fill out a quick post webinar survey, but otherwise we do hope to see you at a future Tech Strong Learning webinar. Everyone have a great rest of your day.